Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with the silky dance moves, I might say, from my cohort. This is nothing but miss your favorite local basketball show. You were usually covering the Raptors, but we've moved on to playoffs. This is episode nine. I'm Ba, and joining me, like always, with the beautiful hat I've already mentioned, my man Melky. How's it going, brother? What's good, baby? What's good? Ah, yo, hello, Nana Nation, b-ball fans all over. It's Melky here, feeling so fresh and so clean. The world's opening up, and your boy finally got his hair cut. Ooh. Ooh, the world is right again for you, eh, Melk? Oh, man, you have no idea. You know, finally, finally, I'm not mistaken for someone who carries a boomstick. <laughs> it just feels so it just feels so good, brother. Yeah, I always feel bad for everyone because I'm I'm kind of fortunate. My significant other there uh, is in the industry, so yeah. I'm kind of got a cheat code towards that. <laughs> I can't explain why I always look greasy, but moving on. So <laughs> we are excited for episode nine. We wanted to shoot these out in quick succession. There's so much happening in the NBA. Like the last two episodes, we're going to start with covering what happened in the conference finals, and then we're going to move on, of course, to what's happening now in the NBA finals. So starting out in the East, it was Milwaukee Bucks versus the Atlanta Hawks, and Milwaukee wins it in six. The series is four to two. Melky, your thoughts, buddy? Wow, what a series. Yeah. What a... What events? <laughs> Who would have thought that both superstars would go down in this series? Uh, it was fun. You know, uh, I felt bad picking against Atlanta, but I, you know, when you kind of know when a run is over. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it, the writing was on the wall. And especially like when Trey went down, because yeah. Trey dictates everything when it comes to them. Like, no disrespect to the, the Hawks, but Trey is the driving force and him going down, they looked lost out there. Uh, even though they did manage to win two games, especially game four without him, which was fantastic. Yeah, uh, they you know, capitalized that game. That was massive. Oh yeah. You know, they put the thumb to, uh, to Milwaukee and then, you know, then Milwaukee losing Giannis and everyone, I'm sure the whole entire NBA world stood up, gasped and said, okay, the, the bucks are over. But I didn't think that way. When he went down, I'm like, well, whose bench is better? Whose overall team is better if these two superstars aren't in the lineup? And the Bucks, by far, had the superior team. So it wasn't surprising that the Bucs uh, put them away. Yeah, Bucks depth is what I have underlined for this series, man. I Not that I've been doubting the Bucks, but I've been choosing pretty much their opponent every matchup. So I have been uh, no more of that. And what Melky alluded to, by the way, is Giannis. If everybody saw that replay, that gruesome like hyper extension that looked nasty. He was out game five, game six, which was the clinching game. And then Trey Young was actually out games four and game five with a bone bruise and came back game six. But I got to be honest with you, Mel, he did not look right. Like, I mean, he looked like a guy coming early. The team, they kind of like you said, they knew where it was happening. Let's get the fans going. Let's let's just end on a positive note. And I definitely think their season left on a positive note. Like, even though you lost, like I'd be holding my head fucking high. Oh, it's a Cinderella story that just, you know, came to an end. And the future looks bright for them. You know, uh -huh. bless bless um, Trey's miniature heart. He uh, he did what he could, but you're right. He when you can't push off your foot and you require speed as part of your game, you can't you know use your foot. It's uh, it, it makes you a one dimensional you know cat. So unfortunately, uh, yeah, they met their demise because of it. But they have nothing to be ashamed of. The future is bright in the ATL, and it's about time because that's a party city, man. Yeah, Trey Young's going to be leading that team. They got all the the firepower needed this season with the bullshit going on, Knicks, whatever. Like, there is when that shit happens and a team is this good, there is like a brotherhood bond. Like, I think Atlanta is going to be a dominant force going forward. I I agree with you, and you know what? They're probably a piece away, probably yeah. you know like a, a Robin to Trey's Batman. Because yeah. I don't think they he, they have that yet. Like Cam Reddish looked great coming back from injury. He uh, looked awesome coming off injury they were comparing him to um, uh, um, pg-13 yeah game and, six 21 points he was yeah. six seven out of three pointers i mean he stepped up when needed he was great you know uh, but i can't say the same for john collins yeah you want to you want a max contract and you put up pedestrian numbers uh what was a game 
do, 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 sorry. Yeah, it was game six. The stats were 13 points, 11 rebounds, and one assist. Yeah. You're the, you're the next man up, and you can do anything to elevate your team. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's pretty clear where they faltered. Atlanta, you're talking about depth. On the other side, you already brought it up, Milwaukee. <clears throat> These guys stepped up when Giannis went down. And I mean, I have it in bold capital letters, Chris Middleton. I mean, this guy balled out, unreal playing by him and, and the shots he was making. He shows what he can do when he's um, when he's capable of it. He averaged those the last two games. He averaged 29 points, 8.5 rebounds and 7.5 assists. And his counterpart and his uh, partner, sorry, Drew Holiday. He came to the party too. Both 26, of them. Yeah. yeah. 26 points, 7.5 rebounds, and 11 assists for the games five and six. So they obviously had the depth. They utilized, I think Milwaukee utilized their strength correctly in Absolutely. those last two games. And they should have been doing it from the start, but, you know, they did it. They realized, hey, we can just bully this team around. And that's what they did. Yeah, seriously, it shows how much kind of a, a better team they are depth wise. Uh, you brought it up, J. Rue Holiday. Point guards are so important in the playoffs, man. I mean, this position can win you championships, and he's doing fantastic. He had 27 points, nine rebounds, nine assists, four steals, game six. Bring it back to Chris Middleton, 32 points. And everybody's mm -hmm. talking about that massive third quarter where he had 16 points, almost hitting every three pointer. Giannis, who? Yeah. Well, it's it's kind of crazy how different the the team looks with him in the lineup and without him in the lineup. Yes, and there's more team ball. And give a sh and give a shout out to Brooke Lopez. This, Good, yeah, great call. This guy was an all star in Brooklyn. They called him Brooklyn Brook for a reason, man. Like he was a perennial all star, and he utilized his abilities. Um, Bobby Portis Jr. He also was uh, game five. He had a great game five. Um, great bench player, too. Yeah. Especially that article coming out about how he talked to Giannis and wanted to get onto the box. And, I mean, he's been a great depth player for them. Yeah, and he, he was a high draft pick, too. So he was utilizing his um, his his strength, his uh, his height, his ability. And that's the, the Hawks are just miniature compared to the Bucks. So, like like we both have just said, they used, they used their physical presence, and that's what pushed them to the, the NBA championship. I mean, game six, Brooks Lopez was a plus 25 on the court, like a plus 25. Like, and, and that's big man. And then not only that, just a uh, small shout out, that Pat Connaughton guy. I honestly didn't know much about him, but he has been a great, uh, again, I keep using the word death. I'm going to keep using it. But I mean, this Bucks team's rolling and I, I, I didn't doubt them, but I haven't been picking them. And obviously I wasn't paying attention because even besides like their coach, Bud, sometimes making some iffy decisions. The talent on this team, Melky, is too good, even for poor coaching in a way. And yeah. I'm not even saying he's done a poor coaching job. I'm just no. saying some mistakes he's made, in pre but like they're just so good all around. But look at the team since he's taken over as a head coach the last three years. They were built to win. Like They finished first in the division, second yeah. in the division, third in the division. Like This team is built to win now. And depth you've hit it you've nailed it depth 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 they have depth everywhere at every position but they don't ever use it all the time and as Kendrick Perkins said they're like one of the dumbest teams in the NBA because of it they don't use their physical presence they don't use their strength so that's why it's hard to jump on their bandwagon but you know what they actually put the foot down and they got it got the job done so kudos Man, I got to give a shout out to Perkins. The last few uh, weeks, he's kind of been sensible, even his take last night. Uh, we'll get into that a bit later, what happened in the game. But just telling everybody to kind of calm down and what you're saying. So that guy's usually full of hot takes, man. <laughs> Love the big perk. <laughs> yeah. So uh, quickly, just to, because we brought him up, Brooke Lopez, 33 points, career high. I wanted to give him a shout out. There were four Bucks uh, starters who had over 20 points in that game five. And you could kind of tell that... When Atlanta won that game when Giannis went down, that was the chance where where that small playoff margin where something could happen happen magically. But they came out the next game and they showed why they were the best team. Clearly, well, it was next man up, and it was the next two men up plus the role players. So, yeah. I I don't think Atlanta stood a chance. But Atlanta can't be mad at all. Great season. No, no, Trey Young. I mean, career high forty eight points game one as well. And uh, 
I don't know about you, but I was just thinking about like you asked me what were the keys to the Bucks kind of winning. What was the reason? And I was saying they were more aggressive in the final games. Like they wanted it more. I'm not saying Atlanta didn't, but there was that hustle. They're a great defensive team. Not that they're underrated, but the fact that they were moving so well offensively between J. Ru and Chris, that defense shines through. Like they cut off those shots from Trey, from everyone. Well, those two were known for being great defenders too. So there's no reason why uh, they couldn't shut down Trey and shut down the rest. And once Trey was down, it was, I'm not saying it's easy. It's never easy to shut down someone or shut down anyone in the NBA, but it was slim pickings. They were just like, yeah, I'm going to shut, I'm going to stop you. I know what you can do. You haven't been shooting. Like Collins didn't shoot the ball well in this series. You look at guys like uh, Sweet Pepper Lou, Gallinari, Herter. They did not play well in the series either. So it, it made it a little easier for them to shut them down. I knew they played a lot, but I didn't realize how much of a long ball game Milwaukee has and how much is kind of put on those two guys. I mean, you obviously have Giannis coming off the dribble, and he might be one of the scariest guys coming off of that. Uh, but the amount of shooting, and when that doesn't go for them, that's usually what happens when the Bucks lose, right? So kind of crazy to watch. And I was going, I think I chose Atlanta, didn't I? I said, fuck it, let's go Atlanta. Yeah, and then I jumped on your bandwagon and like, let's go, man. Atlanta Phoenix final. Well, we were hyping up Trey, man, after all the shit that happened. That was a fun bandwagon to join. Screw it. it was, it's, you know what? I had fun watching this team. I never thought I'd actually say I had fun watching the Atlanta Hawks. Yeah, honestly. Okay, uh, any last pointers for that? Uh, I think everything was said. Uh, the better team won. That's all, that's all you could really say in this case. But both teams should be proud. Atlanta, you're no slouch. Go get a go get a Robin to uh, Trey Young. You, he needs a Robin. Think big. That's all I could say. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the savant Melky here on the podcast. I'm loving it. <laughs> all right. So that was the Eastern Conference Finals. We're moving on to the Western Conference Finals, and we had the Phoenix Suns, Melky's childhood team, versus the Los Angeles Clippers. Kawhi, please come home, but you're there anyways. Phoenix wins it, game six, the series four to two. When we actually recorded our last episode, the Suns were up three to one in the series. So we can still kind of give an overview, but if you want to go back and listen, folks, you'll hear kind of what happened in the first few games. We're going to focus on kind of the series in general and the last few games. Uh, Melky, go ahead, buddy. So Phoenix wins it in six. It's basically three superstars versus one. That's what it came down to. Uh, And you know what? I normally, I'm the first to make fun of uh, Pandemic P. I've called them P-U-P, Pandemic P, you suck P. No more. But no more. He proved, <clears throat> without a shadow of a doubt, the man can ball, the man can step up when needed to. He was playoff P, and I'm not going to make fun of him ever again until next year. Um, <laughs> That's the but, whole point of sports, man. It's all what you have for me lately. Absence. Well, it's always like, what have you done for me lately, right? <laughs> so we'll wait till next season and see what he's what he's done for the Clippers. But yeah, the Phoenix Suns were just too much. Like, what can you say when Chris? Okay, first of all, they didn't even have Chris Paul in the first two games. Yeah, and, and they won, and Phoenix won by the skin of their teeth, especially game two. And then Chris Paul didn't play well in games three or four. And then all of a sudden, Chris, however. however <laughs> Chris Paul remembers, hey, I'm playing against the team that dumped me and blamed me for all their misfortunes when it was obviously that stupid ginger Blake Griffin. And look what he did in game six. Career high numbers, 41 points, four rebounds, eight assists, seven of eight, three-point shooting. This man's not known as three-point shooter. But he said, I'll be damned if we're going back to Phoenix for game seven, and I'm going to do this on L.A. soil to stick it to them, and bravo, he finally gets over the hump. Yeah, it was completely unreal, that second half. I mean, he had 31 points alone, uh, game six, second half. Pretty much put the shoulders on his back. Greg Jennings said exactly what you said. I This is my one chance since I was vetoed the trade to play with Kobe to actually make the finals, mm-hmm. and I am not going to miss it. 31 points in the second half, zero turnovers in the entire game. This guy, not only the on-court 
production, but he is a general, a leader. It is obvious with that team. I mean, his 41 points, they book, they back it up. Booker, 22 points. Crowder, 19 points. Aiton, 16 points, 17 rebounds. I mean, this team was balling out. And Chris Paul, I have five exclamation marks beside him. The word amazing, I mean. And then shout out Pat Beverly. Maybe, maybe show that this man wearing the sunglasses behind my co-host <laughs> got got to you mentally. There is no bigger way to show that you have lost the series than by doing something like that to a guy who was not even talking shit, really. So, I think he might have muttered something. Well, Chris of course, Paul I didn't tra- talk much. I didn't okay. say okay, okay, much. All right, all right, okay. Because you know, Chris Paul's got a mouth on him. But, you, but come on, man. You're like losing the series. This guy's like a vet. You don't even fucking pull that. This isn't hockey where you can drop the gloves. Like, come oh, on. He's a, oh, he's a baby. He showed uh, he has no class. Uh, that's that's what a sore loser does. You shove a man from behind. You don't even like go up to him to his face. You shove him from behind. Yeah, you're, you're a coward. You know what? Uh, you're lucky that you're somewhat respected because I don't even think you have much of a game. You really shouldn't be in the NBA. But... You know, you just showed what a piece of shit you are. And then you go on Twitter or whatever it was and say, um, motions were high. My bad, bro. Congratulations. Really? You may as well not have said anything. That didn't feel like a heartfelt apology. Man, up yours. Cram it with walnuts. Yeah. Sorry. I'm a dickhead. I shouldn't have done it. That's simple. I don't think said. <laughs> yeah, just man up. I mean, you know what, though? Besides that bitch move, playoff P, he balled out 41 points. I mean, 13 rebounds in game five to keep the series alive single-handedly force it to a game six, even when it, it shouldn't have been. But I think in the end, Melky, when you watch this series and we were watching all the games and talking, I think missing Kawhi and exhaustion set in for the Clippers. There were too many times where they were down games in series and came back or they were down players and they played through it. Or they won the game even though they were down going into the half. And I think without their superstar Kawhi, it kind of just got to them. Oh, absolutely. It's too many hurdles, you know, for them to climb. And like like you said, no like no chance in hell without Kawhi. Uh, not only that, there were no bigs to cover Aiden. Yeah. Uh, Zubats went down. They threw like Boogie. Boogie moves as fast as a snail. Um, you know, Maurice uh, Morris, or sorry, Marcus Morris, he... Not really a, a centered, like a big defender. No. 26 points, though, game six. Not bad. Oh, he can ball offensively. Like, this man, he's the better twin. He can ball, but <laughs> like, he's, he's the way better twin, hands down. But, like, they they had no answer in the, in the paint. And then also, Terrence Mann, you shrank to a boy. He averaged in this whole entire series 8.3 points, three rebounds, and one assist. That's we were just getting. praising him. We were just praising him a couple episodes ago. Yeah, he, he shrunk in the moment. I just don't think he could handle it. Uh, the Sun, and obviously the Suns were too much too. And the Suns' depth is way better than uh, the Clippers as well. You know, honestly, you don't have your big fish. You don't have your your big gun. You're not winning a war. So, unfortunately for the Clippers. Yeah, I mean they've got like I said before, Jay Crowder is balling out. Aiton, who looks finally like the projected big man. Like this, this is a breakout playoffs for this guy, dude. Like 17 rebounds, 16 points, just massive gameplay. Like I, I'm going to get into it later, but I'll just say it now that where they did the 10 passes, that beautiful play where everybody touched it before Aiden put it in. I almost threw up. It was a thing of beauty. It, it was, it was like uh, watching Picasso do one of his masterpieces. That, that was incredible. Yeah, yeah. And I also like Devin Booker, too, kind of talking shit and being real <laughs> in, in a way, too. He's, he, you know, what? he looks like a quiet dude, but he is because Kobe was a shit talker, too. And that's his mentor. Yeah. So he, he, he just gets away with it because he's got that baby face. But he, he's a big trash talker, too. And you learning from Chris Paul, that always helps. OK, so the man with the sunglasses behind Malk. We're going to keep talking about this team in a second because we're moving on to the next round. But just quickly, the whole point of this series for the West, I think it's giving respect to not only Paul George, but the coach we've talked about for two episodes now, the players coach, Mr. Lou, Coach Lou. Ty Lou, 
Yeah, big ups to Tyler. He proved without a shadow of a doubt that it wasn't a flash in the pans when he was in Cleveland. He knows how to coach. He, he like you, you alluded to perfectly. Players coach. He uh, adapted well. He adjusts well. He um, he's great on the fly. Like and when his back's against the wall, he showed he can persevere. Taking this team as far as it uh, as he did, honestly, I think if they had Kawhi, no no disrespect to Monty Williams and the Suns, I think the Clippers would be in the finals if they had Kawhi in this series. Yeah, I think that's actually a, a serious debate that you could have, and and I almost agree with you just because I saw what Kawhi did in Toronto, and I mean the way Paul George played, I mean the way that team can play when those two guys are on top because when they're on top, I mean they're getting you what eighty points a night together, so it. Really, you don't have to do much except some great defense and kind of help them out on the perimeter. Absolutely. I, I got a question for you. Okay. The ultimate question. Yes. Why resigning with the Clippers? I think so at this point. I wanted to say before no, but I have a feeling with the injury, the way Paul George performed, it's kind of like in a way, not that they proved it to the haters for the Clippers, but it's like they were there. There's that fire there as an athlete. So I think he does resign. I, I don't necessarily think long term, but I do think he resigns for you. Yeah, he's <clears throat> they're going to run it back um, for a few reasons. Unfinished business and there's a new stadium coming mm-hmm. to Goldwood. Mm-hmm. And wouldn't it be something that bomber yeah. money, that bomber money. Yeah. Bomber money, bomber money is 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 real, people. It's real, and wouldn't it be something for them to now have their own stadium and not be the stepchildren of the Staples Center, and go out and win and prove that they're the better team in LA? So there, there's a lot of motivation there for him to come back. I really see that happening, and also with LeBron and the bullshit hype he's getting Space Jam to the media circus, <laughs> they're gonna want Kawhi. Like this is gonna be a battle of attrition in LA. Like they're gonna go at it. I can't wait to see. And then Kawhi, sure, come on back afterwards, buddy. Would you want him back, though? I mean, I'll I'll take back any former Raptor at a reasonable price. <laughs> you know I, me, you know, man. I have allegiance, hardcore. You, you do. You do. You wear your heart on the sleeve. I would – I don't know because I don't know if he – I mean, he when he's on top of his game, he's a top five player in this league, hands down. But the injuries and the – Uncle Dennis bullshit and the yeah. and the sitting out and load management. Sorry, that's what I was looking for. Is it worth it? It seems like a bit of a headache. And him being so, he's thirty. Let's just say he comes back at thirty-two. Is he the same player at thirty-two? Yeah, in a in a serious answer, and it's going to be kind of a spoiler alert for the future. Toronto's my second best option for Dame Lillard. I think there are better options than Kawhi coming back. My heart, I would, if Kawhi came back to the Raptors, I would welcome him back with open arms is what I'm saying. But yeah, you make a lot of great points. And I think there's a lot better options, especially with the team we've built because we've kind of moved past him at this point in a way. So yeah, like we, we kind of knew it was a one and done, but if he does come back, I can get that Kawhi jersey out of my closet and actually sport it. So yeah, but see, you know what, though? That Kawhi jersey's clutch for all time, even if he never comes back, and it almost especially if he doesn't come back, because you have the superstar jersey the year we won the championship. It's not like we blew it and lost to LeBron. Again, it was lebron So that jersey's always clutch. Yeah, this is why you're the wise one. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, because if he comes out in, like, three years, and it's just like, I truthfully really fucking hated Toronto, and Canadian people are ugly as shit, and it's like, oh, okay, all right. Fuck. Yeah. Probably at Chris Bosh and saying Toronto smelled funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But he's all hyped now that we have the number four pick again, man. It's a brotherhood again. Of course. It's all love now. It's all love. All right. Enough talking about losers, Melk. We're moving <laughs> on. Finally, what well, we've been excited. Episode nine, counting down to it. It is the NBA Finals. That trophy behind you is up for grabs. Right now, as we speak, after three games, Phoenix is leading the series 2-1 to one with a massive, massive Bucks win the other night. Like a crazy win. And didn't I call it? What did I text you beforehand? Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah, you, you seem to have your little crystal ball going and uh, you called it. Uh, not even that. What about Giannis? What about Giannis, man? 
Are you talking about back to back forty plus doubles? I you're exactly talking talking about that. And that hasn't been done since Shaquille O'Neal. That's yeah. some big time numbers. Yeah, it it's it's gonna be an obvious answer to a question you're gonna ask me kind of at the end of this final segment about certain awards or whatever. But the way this guy is playing, I'm gonna say it right now. So Gianna, so dominates 41 points, 13 rebounds, six assists, back to back 40 point double doubles, like Melk said, not since Shaq. Quickly to bring up this photo because quickly without dead air. <laughs> yeah, he is he is averaging this series after three games. He's averaging 34.3 points per game, 14 rebounds, and 4.7 assists per game. Unreal. So if you want to talk about who right now is taking the Bucks and trying to get them this championship, it's Giannis. Because honestly, there's been a couple of nice patches, but Chris Middleton, who we've praised before, he's got to step it up a little bit. He he had a terrible game two. He kind of came back in game three last night, I think had 18 points or whatever. But there's a couple of guys like Jay Rue needs to gar- start going again. They're getting below 20 points, and the Bucks need more. The problem is, too, you know what's strange? What? Why can't Brooke Lopez and Giannis play together on the, on the, mm-hmm. at the same time? It, yeah, you can only have one or the other, which I think it kills the Bucks because you have two twin, you have two twin towers. One can shoot the three, and the other can just own the paint, and you can't utilize that at all. Why do you think they don't do that? Because it, it's blatantly obvious at some points. Well, that's their Achilles' heel. Because I, I just don't know why it doesn't work, and all the analysts are saying, "Oh, you got to put Brook." Le- Brooke Lopez on the bench in the fourth quarter. He's detrimental to the team in the fourth quarter. But he could be a, an asset. And I just don't understand how those two don't mesh. <clears throat> like, they'll mesh in the regular season. But when it comes to playoff time, you can't. they can't uh, feed off each other. I, just, I don't understand it. And not only that, they're playing a lot of more smaller ball-minded teams as well. A lot of perimeter teams. Like, I don't understand what you're saying, too. It, it's like... I'm not going to bring up hockey because I'm refusing <laughs> any podcast, but it's sometimes the coaching decisions with the lead. I just don't understand why there's this change in mentality in the playoffs. If what took you to the playoffs was so successful that you were dominating a whole conference, why change? I, I just don't understand it. Yeah. Like, like, uh, and you, like you can use that inside outside game. But for whatever reason, I think maybe it's because Giannis likes to have the ball. It likes to dribble in with the ball. I don't know. Like, and it just makes Lopez stand in space. I'm not 100% sure. Only Bud knows and, you know, Milwaukee knows. But I find it very strange you can't utilize Brooke Lopez because I'm, I'm telling you right now, if Brooke Lopez was used in this series, it would be a different outcome right now. Yeah. And, I mean, you're speaking of big men, and I'm going to agree with you there. But on the other side, Phoenix – Part of the reason the Bucks were killer in Game Three is that Phoenix's big man, the young superstar Aiton, got into some serious foul trouble with five fouls. And dude, that Dario Saric injury—that is an Achilles' heel to this team, like a big one. They don't have anyone in the front court, uh, like Frank Kaminsky. He can't do anything. There's a reason why he was a bust in the draft. He played like 14 minutes last night, didn't he? Yeah. He, very sparingly. He's he's not going to be a difference maker. He's just a body at this point. It's it's crazy because, like, I have uh, for the Bucks to win, obviously, number one, I had the Greek Freak's health. He looks perfectly fine. I've never seen someone have a hyperextended knee and <laughs> look like they're walking on sunshine the next fucking day. Dude, he's either one of the toughest son of the bitches in the NBA right now or it wasn't as bad as it was. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But he... I mean, he works, he dedicates his body to health and fitness. So could be that he, you know, he prepared his body for that damage. Uh, Next, I had um, the supporting cast, Holiday, Middleton, Lopez. Obviously, we cross out Lopez because they're not using his ass. But Holiday and uh, Middleton. I I also want to ask you something. Why why can't Middleton, Holiday, and Giannis all have balling games at once and the same game? Yeah, I don't understand that. It seems to be kind of a, a pairing it's jay rue and chris absolutely ball out together or it's giannis 
completely balls out 40 plus point and you have chris middleton usually around the like like 15 25 not low like 15 but he's there with some good rebounds and stuff like that but you're right it's never a cohesive team unit it's enough where you're either getting like completely balanced scoring kind of from them where everybody's around the 20 point range and chris and jay rue have a big game or it's giannis has 40 plus and everybody else is like 18 average yeah which tells you everything goes through giannis which seems to be a blessing and a curse all at once. Because his shooting has been not great. Well, Phoenix, they need to keep him out of the paint. I know it's easier said than done, but Phoenix has to find a way and just I don't know who who they have left on their roster, but they need to find some bodies to like get him. Like Maybe Aiden should try and not get into foul trouble. Keep him on the outside. Let him take his ridiculous-looking shots and put him on the line and let him take his over 10 second free throw shots because that's the only way you're going to contain this man. Yeah. I'm uh, I could be legitimately concerned. I, I know Chris Paul has leadership, but I don't know the way Giannis is playing. It's pretty scary for Milwaukee right now. Like it's, I mean, Booker. So we have uh, Chris Paul, 19 points, nine assists, Booker, 10 points, Crowder and Aiden, 18 points each. But in game three, Booker is three for 14 shooting. That is a massive blow to this team, Melky. Uh, do you uh, do you agree with uh, Monty sitting him out in the fourth quarter? Man, I have actually gone back and forth on that. So I'm going to say no. I'm going to rest on no. What about you? At first, I at first I said no because you you know you're basically it's not. It's not embarrassing him or making him like a spectacle, but at the same time, you're you're punishing like a kid that's had one bad game in the playoffs. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's that mentality. We've lost the battle, but we still have a war to fight. Let's let's just wait till like basically he threw the white flag and said, let let's just wait for game four. Yeah, I get what you're saying, too. His confidence is already shook. You don't want it anymore. The damage has been done. Regroup. It's okay, kid. Get it together. I just feel sometimes, especially in the finals like that with these superstars, sometimes you got to let them shoot it out of their system. That poor performance, but that was that was a tough one. It's frustrating because I've always been a, a good uh, a good coaches kid, you know. Like I always <laughs> listen to the coach and stuff. I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, no problem. You want me to play there? Okay, whatever. I I think it, I think with book, he's got a good head on his shoulders. I think he's going to use that as motivation. I look for him to come out in game four, um, probably like in the first quarter, twelve to fourteen points. I think he's going to get it started right. I think Chris Paul's going to look to him. Yes, sir. I think Phoenix is going to be buzzing game four. I think so, too. I I think Milwaukee, like Milwaukee's done a decent job on CP3, but I think a key in this series, too, is containing him. Because obviously, where Phoenix go, where Chris Paul goes, that's where Phoenix goes, hands down. Like, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. And I think Milwaukee, Phoenix can afford to lose all the games in Milwaukee. But Milwaukee can't afford to lose all the games in Phoenix. Yes. So stealing a game on the road, I think, is going to be tricky for them. So they need to pounce now. But I'm just look. I think Chris Paul has it in his head. This is probably the only time I'm getting to the finals, unless he joins some crazy super team in the off season. Let me get it done now. So he's got these boys on edge. He's got them hyped up. He's got them ready to roll. And I. I I can honestly see it being 3-1 going back to Phoenix. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm glad you brought them up because you know what? It's a bit of recency bias that we're hyping up Milwaukee because they just won the other night, even though every game Giannis has been dominant. I mean, that's just proof in the pudding. But going back to the first two games that Phoenix actually won, game one, it's a 118-105 win. Chris Paul, 32 points, nine assists, 16 points in the third quarter. I was actually freaking out watching my TV, watching this guy just draw those threes and everything. Unreal. Booker, 27 points. Aiton, 22 points, 19 rebounds in one game for a young kid like this. Unreal. I mean, 
Giannis had 20 points, 17 assists, Middleton 29 points. But uh, the Suns' pick-and-roll game was on full display game one. Everybody was rolling behind Chris Paul, that leadership, that veteran. And then moving into game two, 118-108 win by the Suns, even though Giannis balled out with 42 points. I want to bring up the fact that 23-pointers were made by Phoenix Suns in a single game. Did you see how well Devin Booker shot shot the yeah. ball? Yeah. He's not known for a three-point shooter as a three-point shooter, but he, he was on fire. I think he went, what was Book's uh, numbers? He went seven for 12 from three in that uh, game, too. Like that's that's lights out. That's that's Mamba mentality right there. And I was gonna go through like what Phoenix needs to do to win this series. That was one of them. That was one of the key points. Booker shooting range. We all know him as a mid range shooter, and God bless him, love it. But if he can extend his range and hit, and maybe go like four for ten, five for ten, uh, in those numbers, that's gonna help immensely since their lineup is being depleted with all these injuries. So that helps campaign Cam Johnson, Crowder, uh, Mikel Bridges. They need to step up. Bridges had a great, what was it, game two? Yeah. Yeah, game two, I think he had 20. 27 points. Yeah. yeah, Bridges was on fire running the court, running up and down the court. I uh, forgot that guy was 24. I didn't realize I, <laughs> that old man, honestly. That team is young, man. Besides Crowder, and Crowder's not even old. I think he's like 30. Yeah, and, and Chris Paul, um, like they're a young team, man. Like they're just a young up and up and coming, like high energy team, and they're ready for it. You can tell. Like Chris Paul has them in line, uh, but yeah, like they need help from those players. Like campaign was terrible in Game Three. Yes, he was. He was not great. It was garbage. Cam Johnson was garbage. Besides the dunk on Tucker, which was fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's dunk of the playoffs for me right now. But he had an absolutely terrible game. Middleton was brutal game two as well. Oh, oh hands down. And the, I think the most important or most important key factor for Phoenix to, you know, finally get a get a championship is not allowed Charles Barkley to curse the damn fucking team with his guarantees. <laughs> And yeah, and thank God they're off. I mean, not thank God. I love that's the best sports show on on the planet. Uh, yeah, hands down. But like, it's good not to hear Charles Barkley make guarantees with the Phoenix Suns because he had to curse this team. They probably would have gotten swept if it wasn't if it was for him. So <laughs> thank God, Charles Barkley. <laughs> because you can tell he's cheering for the Suns, a hundred percent, and he knows not to do it himself. I fucking love it. Yeah, it's like keep your mouth shut, Charles. I love you to death. No guarantees on that front. You can guarantee the Bucks all you want. <laughs> Curse <Yeah>. them. <laughs> Seriously. And you know what? Beforehand, man, when you brought up uh, Booker's shooting would be such an important factor. I'm so glad you brought that up because that was a question we were kind of asking ourselves. Yeah. Uh, key matchups or what are going to be things that are going to help one team win over the other. That's a big one. I have, and I've brought it up before, but I have the battle of the point guards is another one for me. I've got J. Rue versus Chris Paul. I mean, this position is one of my favorite and it can win you franchises. And I think the battle between these two, which has already been on display, but it is big. It's probably the most evenly matched out of like any of the positions. Like um, Holiday. Two A is the best, man. They're two oh, easily. And Holiday, man, he can defend. Like when he was with the Pelicans, when he was even with uh, the 76ers, he's a dog, man. Like he was just a dog. Under just yeah, just on bad teams. Like, that 76 er team he was on was hot garbage. Uh, but, like, that that matchup is so key. I'm glad you brought that up, too. Like, it's the battle of the point guards. I think it's the most evenly matched because John is obviously is the best player in the series. Yes. yes. And at the position, he outweighs anyone that they throw on the Phoenix side. Uh, I think Booker is better than Middleton. Yes. Uh, and I think immensely better. Like Middleton can go hot, and Middleton can he's streaky, but bo I, like Booker is just closer. Milwaukee's yeah. closer is him. Yeah, Booker is so, definitely above. Yeah, like I think he's head head and shoulders above Middleton. So like you're just looking at all these components, and then like uh, like Bridges versus Tucker, and like the bench play, you know, um, with the uh, the cams and. Uh, well, I guess they're only using seven men now. <laughs> that, that, that's uh, Sarge. It's down, a short right? bench, yeah, dude. That that injury, I'm telling you right now, that is such an Achilles heel. Like that, 
that'll be a massive turning point if Milwaukee ends up winning the finals. That was a big blow when Sarge went down. I'm like, shit, they don't have another really big body because Crowder's. I think Crowder's only six eight. Uh, I say only because fuck, I'm only five eleven. But yeah, he's <laughs> um, he's about six seven, six eight, and he plays uh, he plays the four. And then you have like like we were saying Frank Kaminsky. Like, what the fuck has Frank Kaminsky ever done? And, yeah. <laughs> and you have and you have Aiden, right? So there's the, the big bodies aren't really there uh, to guard um, Giannis and uh, Lopez and Porter Porter Jr. So. Yeah, like it's going to be a great series. So my question to you is, what's your prediction? Uh, oh man, I have blown it with pretty much every prediction. <laughs> so why, so man? So, <laughs> so, so I want to say Milwaukee. I have been doubting them, and Giannis is putting on such a performance. But in my heart, I want Chris Paul to win this championship so bad. And the fact that it's with Phoenix, a team that I don't hate, their jerseys are nasty, I can get behind. (laughs) That being said. That's important, folks. I hope I'm wrong. I think Milwaukee's going to win it. Ooh, and how many games? I've changed it. I think it's going to go game seven. Game seven. So a heartbreaker, another heartbreaker in Phoenix. Yeah. Uh, okay okay it's, it, it's the year of heartbreaks man england what have you so <laughs> i was gonna ask you that <laughs> how does that feel uh buddy germany was team one england was team two i'm okay with it <laughs> yeah, your brother must have went nuts though ah yeah we were okay man we're we're so ger- you know what it's like german no canada germany england okay okay Fair we're, enough. our families are a bunch of mutts man my my <laughs> My ancestors were a bunch of whores. We just slept around. I'm a mix of everything. You're, you're a product of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a product of it. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to ask you the same question. What do you think? See, I wanted to jump on that, uh, the celebrity Suns fan and say Suns and four, but I'm not stupid. Uh, it w- it would have been hilarious, but a great soundbite. But I'm going Suns and Six. Uh, Milwaukee, they could be a devastating team. But, but, they shoot themselves in the foot. Every chance they get when it matters. Yeah, they've been great this playoffs and a little lucky too in that Brooklyn series. Because, I'm sorry, you're not winning that series. Those first two games were a story that was going to be told of that series in a sweep. Now, the, okay, so moving on. They're in the finals. Giannis is a beast. Yeah. We, we don't deny that. But Milwaukee shoots themselves in the foot. They don't they don't use their identity. Their identity is being big. Their identity is pounding the paint. Their identity is if they can't get it done in the paint, they throw it out, shoot threes. And you live and die by the three and sometimes Middleton, Holiday, Forbes, and anyone else taking a fucking three on that team misses. And guess what Phoenix does? They don't shoot the three. So Phoenix coming down. It's the sun's year. It's the year of Chris Paul. The sun will be shining in Phoenix very soon. We've got the suns in six. Yeah, I love it. And I'm going to admit to a completely gutty move because right here in my notebook, I have the suns circled in like, (laughs) A son with the lines trying to be like a funny asshole because I did truthfully choose them. I've been so bad in this playoff. That's why I chose the Bucks. It's such a gutty move. I get it. But that's why I chose it because I want Chris Paul to raise this so bad. And the fact that Booker at such a young age and, and what it would mean to Phoenix because – not that I'm a huge Phoenix fan. I mean, in the end of it, I, I am going to grab one of those fucking jerseys. I'll be oh. completely that that's happening. Like you and oh, I are yeah. going to have a nice jersey run. Oh, uh, oh! Spoiler alert! I ordered the Valley Devin Booker <laughs> oh, God, already. <laughs> yeah. Oh, buddy, I'm going to be putting in like a three jersey order in a couple of months. Well, you saw you saw my order from the last one, getting uh, Lowry and um, the Oakland uh, Steph Curry. I had to, man. 
fans, if you could honestly see the collection that this guy is amassing through like memorabilia, jerseys, what have you, it's fucking unreal. And it's making me so jealous because I've got. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to be fair, you just moved. So you're. Yeah, yeah. You're, I got to put that coming. Kawhi. Yeah, that Kawhi photo up again or whatever. Yeah. Your collections, it'll be there. It's in boxes right now. So you know what? I've had time to like display my stuff. You haven't, so okay. So I gotta, we gotta give you that. But going, going back to, um, yeah, I, I, I ordered the Valley. I had to, and honestly, I just think Phoenix knows how much this means to Chris Paul because I, I don't see, like I said, unless he gets put on the Lakers or some super team next season. I don't see him getting back to the finals. And there's no knock on him. Like, this is like a storybook run with a lot of luck with uh, major stars going down. Like, I picked against them, against the Lakers. You know, and I think a lot of people did, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I think you got to do it now. I think they're more of an – they know who they are. I think Monty Williams does a great job reminding them who they are, uh, what Suns basketball is all about. Giannis is a fantastic player, and I would love him to be on the Raptors or on my team. If I'm starting a team, I'd have him on my squad. But they're a different team when he's on the court opposed to when he's not on the court. And that conflicts with the team dynamic. And as great as he's been, Middleton, for whatever reason, feels like he doesn't have to do shit if Giannis goes off. Or Drew Holiday has to wait and see if Middleton wants to do anything for him to pick up the slack. So I can't pick the Bucks. I can't trust them. I don't really give a damn about Wisconsin cheese. So for that, Phoenix and six, people. Yeah, Phoenix and six. They got to capture the Cinderella run. I mean, that's just massive for them. I can't wait for next episode when this is all over. We're going to be discussing everything finals. And, buddy, I hope you're right. I hope Chris Paul has raised that. The tears flow and everything's happening. And potentially, oh, I can't wait. It's tomorrow night, game four. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, so go on. What were you saying? No, I want you to ask part what? two of that question. Okay. I want you to ask. What was part two of the question? Yeah, the MVP. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Okay, so that was the other question. We predicting right now MVP. I'm going to tell you right now, if Milwaukee wins it, it's Giannis. And there's a chance no matter what that Giannis could win it because what he's doing. I think, however, if Phoenix wins it and he plays somewhat good, Chris Paul has it in the bag for the storyline alone. I don't need to add anything else. It's either Giannis, if the Bucks win, it's either yeah. Chris Paul, if, um, if Phoenix wins. Chris Paul, hands down. Yeah, uh, the numbers he's put up, especially the last couple of games. He's yeah, he's already tremendous. played well in the finals. Yes, he's already put up like the big numbers. Yeah. He's. I honestly think. I honestly think he's going to put up some massive numbers. I. I think in Game Six you're going to see a repeat of what he did in LA or something similar. Maybe not the same and like the crazy like seven for eight, but Chris Paul. There's no way he's losing this, these finals. So his CP3 is getting his MVP, pushing him to the top five point guards of all time. Yeah, wow. I mean, that was we were having that debate. We've talked about that list beforehand. I mean, he was in serious consideration for our top tens. Um, I think I almost even had him at like nine or ten, maybe just making the list. But yeah, Chris Paul, the storyline, he's going to win it. Giannis, if, if the Bucks win it, he's simply just outplayed everyone out of the trophy on that team there's just no consideration with what he's doing so those two guys behind you with the glasses i mean what more can you say one of those guys is going to be a champ and an mvp hundo can't wait man can't wait oh buddy we fuck i can't wait till we start watching basketball together again oh shit it's coming things are opening (laughs) <laughs> okay so moving on from our playoff talk now it's time for general nba news going around and we have some kind of big rumors going on around in the nba a superstar is potentially unhappy and wants to be moved we're talking about dame lillard portland trailblazers there seems to be some unrest going after the Hiring of Chauncey Billups. There's some backlash with his past history. The fact that Portland, and we we stated this two episodes ago, 
does not have the team surrounding Dame right now to even be competitive or to be reasonably competitive. So this guy has some serious questions. So Melky, we were going to talk about destinations. I'm just going to give you my two quickly. Okay. My top two. So at number two, I had the Raptors. I said it before. I know that this is a bit of a homer pick, but I actually think it's pretty reasonable with Masai's past bringing a superstar. And I actually think that we have an abundance of wealth that we can make this trade without losing someone big. Like What's we can give up. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking obviously the fourth. We have we have still all of our own first for the next few years, so they're probably going to get a, a couple of picks. I don't want to say necessarily Malachi Flynn, but I definitely think you're going to see someone young go in. Oh, and then who was the name I had for the salary? Well, what do you? So that that's kind of my package for Toronto. Like it's going to be picks. There's going to be a young guy, and then uh, I can't even think of the fucking name. Go. Well, I mean, any deal with Dame is going to be multiple first round picks. Like yeah. this guy's a generational player. The fact that he can just shoot a three and wave bye bye to pandemic P. Yes, I called him that because at that time he was. It's just phenomenal. Uh, I can't. The only reason I don't see it is because he. I don't feel like he as great of a player as he is. I don't think he pushes like the Raptors to that top tier in the east because you're probably giving up malachi flynn you're most likely they're probably asking for og yeah um or they don't want pascal i don't think anyone wants pascal right now especially going through surgery who knows what's what's happening with lowry they might even ask for both freddie and malachi like there's there's so much like that could that can happen i just feel like he's basically back to square one like he would be in, in Portland. I love the idea. I'd, I'd be the first one to get a Dave Dollar fucking Raptors jersey in a, in a heartbeat, but I just don't see the fit. Well, man, excellent points because it brings me to my number one choice, and that's the Golden State Warriors. Oh, I have yeah. getting Dame Lillard, buddy. I think that package of Wiseman, the seventh pick, the 14th pick, Andrew Wiggins as a salary cap, and maybe one other option, I think that is the most perfect trade option for Portland in a rebuild. Dame Lillard gets to play with Steph. There is a not not a I was almost going to use the word dynasty, but there's real competitive like contention right there to be one of the best teams again in the West. Clay comes back, whatever have you, what other moves they make. So I actually see Dame going to Golden State, and that's my choice. That just blew my mind. And I mean, I read those rumors, too. Yeah. But OK, so this would be the repeat basically of Kevin Durant going to go to Golden State. Golden State would win. Multiple championships. Dame and Steph, dude. Dame and Steph. I know they're a small backcourt, yeah. but who fucking cares when you're blowing out teams every night with That's a guy right. with Clay who hasn't played in two years is probably licking Hungry. up the chops. Oh. Hungry, man. Uh, Draymond fucking just running the point and just doing Draymond stuff. You go get maybe book, maybe um, you go get a, a center of, uh, at veteran minimum who just wants to win a championship. Kevin Love probably joins the squad because he just wants a championship. You know what I mean? Like, get those, like, collection of veterans. God, that just, fuck, that just gave me a chub. I'm not going to lie, man. <laughs> yeah, that's what I want to see. I mean, as much as I'm a homer for the Raptors, and that, like you said, I would be buying the Lillard jersey day one. I just think best traded option for both teams going forward and, and kind of what I want to see for the NBA West, fuck it, is, yeah, that man in Golden State with the bridge on his jersey with Steph because – I'll never hate on Steph, man. No, I you can't hate on Steph, man. He, his, his dad played for us. <laughs> I told you, buddy. Homer, right here. Yeah. It's all that hard. Oh, yeah. What about you? That's, you know what? That's a fantastic fucking scenario. I love it. I love it. This is why this is why I partner up with you. You're always thinking out of the box. Yeah. I only picked one because there's only one team that should be making a move and focusing and pulling all their chips in. for. Don't see the next. No, fuck the Knicks. No. Okay, okay, okay. No, not the Knicks because the Knicks don't go. Because they have the, the pieces, are, man. They've got the pieces. They too. have the pieces to make the trade, but it doesn't. It to me, it doesn't make them better than Philly. It doesn't make them better than Brooklyn, and it doesn't make them better um, than Milwaukee. So I, I don't feel like 
it helps him in in the long run. It's great box office, box office like Spike it's, Lee. It, it's selling jerseys. Hundred percent. Spike Lee it's blows his load instantly. Oh. All over Madison Madison Avenue. Cinematic takes. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But Philadelphia 76ers, they need to make this move. You need to have Dame Dollar with Joel Embiid to cement yourself as the beast of the East. Hands down, man. I even got like a little scenario going. And you know what? I think and Daryl Morey is not shy of making bold and blockbuster deals. He's got to do this. Obviously, Ben Simmons. I I thought uh, Matisse Tybel or Maxi or both, and then obviously multiple first round picks for Dame and a second round pick. Philly, if you want to stand up and you want to represent, you need to make this deal right now. There's no other option. Yeah, I absolutely don't want them to make this fucking deal, <laughs> but but everything you said makes sense. I had them in my top five of, of his best destinations, in, including the Knicks that I brought up. I think after his playoff performance, you could definitely see Maxi in, in a deal, multiple picks like you had. And Philly, honest to fuck management, after how you saw Embiid play after he came back, if you're not going to get this guy a man to play with, then you're just Portland East, like – Portland, Philly. Like, what are you doing? What are you honestly doing? You need to maximize. He actually balled out the season. He was the MVP runaway until he got hurt. And exactly. then and then the Joker, obviously. You couldn't stop the Joker after. Yeah. But and if you get Dame, you can maximize and be inside. He doesn't have to step outside as much as he, you know, has to because Ben Simmons won't shoot a fucking basketball. You, you can utilize his strengths. He'll be healthier. He'll he'll be more confident. He'll have more fun. And Dame Dollar is a killer. He's a straight out killer. And you, the pick and roll action with these two. Oh my God, man! Like, I don't like Philadelphia. I'll be anything. pissed off. I'll be pissed off. I don't. I don't care. I don't care about Philly. You know, obviously football. I hate your stupid Eagles with a passion. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> fly <laughs> Eagles, fly. <laughs> Philadelphia, Daryl Moore, you need to jump on this right now. You need to be on the phone with uh, Portland GM and just whining and dining and making this move. I think this is the only move, the best move that needs to happen. Man, we are so good. I have got a gut feeling it is going to be Philly or it is going to be Golden State, one of those two. Melky, last question before we move on. Let's do it. Is there a chance that he stays in Portland? Are you going to give the fans any kind of hope? Because he did come out yesterday and say a lot of people are putting words in my fucking mouth. I didn't say shit. I think there's a good chance. I think there's a 50-50 chance he stays. Uh, he, lo- You know what? Dame loves Portland. He loves the yeah. fans. He loves you know, that small market team. He's done everything he can to lift this team, to get this team far. But the supporting cast and everyone else, they don't help him out. CJ. Like, CJ's been whacking the playoffs. Uh, Nurkic can never stay healthy. Um, Norman, God bless you, man. But like, I don't think Norman puts you like pushes you into that top tier in the West as great of a player as he is and a champion. So like, what else can he do? Like, he's embarrassed Westbrook. He's, you know what I mean. Like, he's beaten Houston. He's beaten good teams, and he's gotten them to the Western Conference Finals. But he needs another star. He needs someone to help him. And you can only do so much until you're kind of fed up. You, you're not going to be young, and you're not going to be a stud forever. So he wants a title. He deserves a title, or at least a chance to play for a title. So, you know, Portland, you better be fishing for a superstar or another superstar. And rightfully so. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, man. One of us is going to be right. Moving on. doesn't go to the Lakers. Put it this way. Yeah, I hate every single moment that that is talked about. Lakers can fuck off. They don't have the assets. I'm sorry. I don't want Kuzma. I don't want Schroeder. I don't want... Dude, it uh, feels like they would be helping the Lakers if that trade happens more than helping themselves. Exactly. You're, you would be shooting yourselves in the foot. You'd be in purgatory for the rest of your NBA career. NBA existence, so no. Oh, I would lose so much respect for Portland because I kind of like them as that small a team. Like Portland's always been cool, man. 
Yeah, I loved when they had Rasheed Wallace. That was my favorite time to watch Portland. <laughs> Badass, man, Rasheed. That was a bad man. Okay, moving on to a little more local flavor. We're going to do a quick shout out to the Team Canada men's basketball team qualifying for the Olympics. Now, sadly, the boys lost out in the semifinals to the Czech Republic. But I don't know if you watched it, Malk. It was actually a really close game. The boys ended up losing it in overtime yeah. by one shot, which was a crazy bank shot that the Czech Republic guy dropped. But more importantly, how this team came back at the end of the game to force it to overtime was some of the best basketball I've seen in the last few months because of how I felt attached to the team. Yeah, you know what? Uh, it was a roller coaster ride, and it's just shitty. It didn't work out the way it should have. I, I, I honestly thought they were going to win this tournament. Yeah, I, I thought. I thought, and it was. It's crazy how the timing of it. It was such a quick tournament. Um, so you, you kind of blinked. You blinked one moment, and they were playing, and then the next you blink, and then the whole thing was done, and it was over. Oh, they like, beat China. Everybody's celebrating, and then they <laughs> lost. And I couldn't. There's like no articles or anything yeah. on it. Who's talking about it? You couldn't find much on it. Uh, it's sad because you know Andrew Wiggins taking that shot, and I, I, I really think Corey Joseph or someone else should have taken it. But I, I get it. You know, Wiggins is, I guess, the best player on that team. Uh, debatable, but it. <sighs> I, it was sad, man, because I think this. I think Canada has enough talent to compete in the Olympics, uh, but yeah, no. I guess it's not, I guess it wasn't our time. So we'll see you in four years. Yeah, I definitely think we have the talent. I mean, we've got the coach. I mean, I will yeah. vouch for that coach day in day out. Nick Nurse. I mean, uh, R.J. Barrett, Corey Joseph, Andrew Wiggins looked like a whole different version of himself. But you brought it up with that shot. I The biggest thing for me with Canada, especially this game against the Czech, too many misses. Yeah. Too many missed shots, too many missed opportunities. And when it comes to these do-or-die games in these short tournaments, man, that that just sets apart who's going to win. Like, it's just – you can't be missing those. No, you can't, and it's unfortunate because I feel like this Olympics, Canada probably could have made a little run. Yeah. Maybe maybe win the bronze. Like, who knows? I, I just think there's a lot of talent out there in, in Canadian basketball. Like, we've developed so much. We could have uh, competed with Italy, Czech Republic, all those hands, teams. In. Hands down, hands yeah. down. You know? And it's just unfortunate we won't, we won't be there. But I think in the next couple – in the next – I think we'll be in the next Olympics. I actually do. I, I think we're going to get some more players. There's going to there's gonna be more development. And we're going to have, we need bigger bodies though. Like yeah. the team is really small. I think yeah. we need some big ones. Like when Powell's your biggest player and no knock on Powell, he's about like six, nine, uh, but that's not getting it done in the paint. So we'll be there. We'll be there soon. Oh, I agree with you, man. It's pretty much like every sport right now, Canada, like we're, we're kind of reaching those Americanized levels of like how much money we're putting into development, youth, what we're producing are just athletes in general at a younger age are just better than they've ever been because of just yeah. their fitness, their diet, whatever, have the, the doctors on hand. So, yeah, we're obviously going to get better. I, I think in a lot of sports, Canada is going to become a force to be reckoned with. And basketball, we're moving up. Oh, hands down. I, I could see us in the, like I said, I'll see, we'll be in the next Olympics in four years. I, We'll be there and representing. We, we might not win, but who cares? We'll, we'll be there. Yeah, you heard it here first, folks. Next Olympics, we're in. Melky guarantee. A milky <laughs> guarantee. Okay. Now moving on to a not-so-funny or great little conversation. We've got some more controversy from a former NBA basketball star. Scotty Pippen, the recent Mr. Loudmouth, which I'm not going to say goes hand in hand with a book, may or may not be coming out soon. And but whiskey. yeah, and whiskey. But uh, he has some comments to say about Phil Jackson and that the infamous sitting during the playoffs and what have you were racially motivated, among many other factors. Melky. if you want to go further, what do you want to give your opinion, buddy? What are you thinking about Mr. Pippen? This is all marketing. Yes, clearly. This, this is all marketing, and I'm going to add it's bitterness that he's still holding on to. Who burns uh, bridges like this, like at this late of a game, like this late of a date? 
Someone, someone who's bitter and trying to make money. <laughs> I feel like it's the world we live in, Melk, man. It's like you're if you talk shit, like infamy is just as good as fame at this point. You make money either way. Well, what's the best way of to uh, what's the best publicity? Negative publicity. And you knew he was gonna be turning heads, dropping. Not only did he drop the Phil Jackson's a racist, yeah. he called MJ is self selfish. He um uh, had his war with Durant. He's just he's just pissing off. Yeah. Yeah, he's just pissing off everyone. And yeah, you know, um obviously there's like money motivated there's money motivating behind all this. Like I wanna you know what? I'm not gonna lie, I wanna read his book. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna purchase that book because I wanna know some dirty secrets and um stuff that happened uh, behind the scenes that that wasn't mentioned in the um, and the Michael uh, Jordan documentary, uh, what's what was the name of the documentary? The Last Dance. Sorry, oh, sorry. Dance, yeah. Uh, and and I and that's where it stems from too. He's saying like this book is based on stuff that wasn't said in The Last Dance, and I just think it's preposterous and crazy that he claimed that Jordan and the NBA planned those cameras there. Yeah, and made it look seems, like yeah, yeah, like it made it seem like okay, he told him to pass it to Kerr, and he like. Who the fuck would have known what play was going to happen <laughs> in that scenario? You know what I mean? Like, Pippen's lost his mind. Dude, and that's why I'll never buy his fucking book, because I can't believe a word he's saying right now. If I want to read a bunch of bullshit, I'll go grab Harry Potter off the bookshelf. So, like, I, I'm just <laughs> I'm not going to support that. Or And you know what? It was pretty obvious from the get-go that the last dance was pretty biased towards Michael. I mean, when you have when you're doing an expose on one of the greatest athletes of all time in an uh, international phenomenon, it's going to be pretty biased. There's no doubt. And if you're upset about that, but, but the way you're going about it now, man, if he had just like, but that that's the world we live in. You need to make that grand entrance, that statement that gets you in the door, gets people being like, Whoa, what did Jackson and uh, Jordan do? And it's just like, so I'll no, I'm never buying his fucking book. I'm going to buy it. Cause I, I like the juicy gossip, but no, you know a documentary is about my MJ. Why would you participate in it? You knew it was going to be basically on him and the team itself in the last year that you were together. Yeah. Why the, why the fuck are you going to participate in it? And you know it's going to be, bi- like you said, biased towards him. And you mean to tell me, what, you, you wanted to focus on you? They did focus on you. The fact that you went and got surgery during the season because you were a little bitch. And also that you sat out that play that you're bitching about. And frankly, the reason why he drew that play for Ku Coach, he's a better shooter than you. Duh. Yeah. And he hits it too, which was the best part of it. <laughs> yeah. and, and Buddy's like talking like he didn't know that the MJ doc was going to be like that and all about It's like when they were asking you how it felt to pass to MJ, did you not like take a second to think, oh, you know what? I'm just kind of a side character in this fucking doc. Kevin had to realize he was never at MJ's level. Like, yes. He was probably the best version of Robin to a Batman ever. Hands down, he did the dirty work. He could pass. He, you know, he had his best seasons. He had his best season when MJ left, but he had another really good season when MJ returned. So, like, you benefited. You got six rings. Excuse me. You got six rings playing with the greatest player of all time. When you went to Houston to play with an out-of-shape Barkley and an old Akeem Olajuwon, you didn't do anything. You fought with Barkley, and you got your and you got basically booted to Portland. And then when you get to Portland with a young and up-and-coming team, you can get them over the hump. You can beat the Lakers. So why are you running your mouth? You should just be happy. You should be fortunate that you are relevant, that you're actually considered one of the top 50 players of all time in the NBA, go out in the sunset, make your damn stupid whiskey that probably tastes like shit. And, you know, make, you can make your book all you want, but fuck, just like shut the fuck up and enjoy life. Like, like you're, you really benefited off of the greatest player in, in NBA history. Yeah. Yeah. You're known as what part of one of the greatest teams of all time. Like you said, go off in the fucking sunset. And I can't wait for the apology forgiveness tour in five years, too. <laughs> Maya culpa. Oh, I actually was best buddies with the team. And when they go back and go back for like the whatever year anniversary of the Bulls, it'll be all smiles. I, I think it'll be a little longer because he, he also stated they were never friends off the court. I know. Him and MJ and 
it was just uh, they just worked really well together on the court. So I, I think a hundred percent. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like there, you go to work, you go to work your daily work, and you're not gonna like everyone. There's God forbid I don't like everyone at my fucking job. Um, you Guys, know, you and, do podcasts with. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There are a couple of people. I'm just like. <laughs> but it works together right and the wink wink nudge and no <laughs> no i actually i actually love every guy i've done the podcast with but uh yeah like pippin this is basically publicity with a slice of bitterness uh i'm not getting the last shot which they won they the bulls won that game and took i think they took the knicks it was a 94 it was a 94 they took the knicks to game seven and lost so like, come on, man. You got six rings. Shut the fuck up. Okay, and that ends the fuck Scotty <laughs> Pippen moment. Brought to you by Melky, which was a fantastic rant, buddy. I couldn't even say more to that. It's just, <laughs> it's just so frustrating and just part of, like, what's going on nowadays. I just don't get, like, you, you're, you're a great player. Like, I always had respect for Scotty Pippen. I always thought he was, yeah, he was, a, he was a little outspoken, but, like, that's fine. He earned his stripes. He was a hard-nosed defender. He was basically the first... A point forward almost like not one of the first but like one of the first point forwards and then you succumb to this and you degrade yourself to this for making for a book and a, and a shitty brand of whiskey like come on man you're better than that yeah yeah i agree with you buddy it's going to come back to bite him in the ass 100 percent. it already has man people are calling him fucked up and crazy yeah okay well Screw that guy. Let's move on to something I'm pumped up for. We had such a blast with the new My Five segment Melky came up with before we did point guards. Now I got to choose. It's our top five big men centers of all time. And Melky, for our top five, I think I'm going to start it off this week, buddy. I was hoping you would. Okay. Okay. So my little list here. At number five, the man of many nicknames. Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal, 23.7 point average, 10.9 rebounds, 2.5 assists, 2.3 blocks, four-time champion, 2,000 MVP, 15-time All-Star, 14-time All-NBA, and a three-time All-Defensive. Shaq was not only in recent memory one of the best centers, which is also why I added onto the list, but for a big man who's had his career afterwards go on and you know he hasn't lost like scotty pippen we're just talking about my respect for shaq is still there like i love this guy so deserving of being in the top five centers easily and he's the last traditional center i think yeah, exactly that's the era. yeah i'm gonna have a little tribute to him too at the end okay so number four after my man shaq hakeem Olujuwon at number four now, this guy was a treat to actually watch, and I enjoyed watching him. I'm going to give you – Not two, in Toronto. <laughs> 21.8 points. I was actually gutted about that. Ugh. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, but he was – No, no, boy. no. No, I was going to bring it up before. Yeah. Fuck it, though. Yeah, it, it was very frustrating, and I almost wanted to put Shaq in front of him be, because of that sole reason. So 21.8 points, 11.1 .1 rebounds, 2.5 assists, 3.1 blocks – Two-time champion, 94 MVP, 12-time All-Star, 12-time All-NBA, nine-time All-Defensive, and a two-time Defensive Player of the Year. Kim Olujuwon, Raptors, I don't like. I'm trying to be a bit more unbiased. I have you number four. Okay, number three. The man who might have banged possibly more women than anybody. I have Wilt Chamberlain coming Ooh. in at number three. Big Wilt. 30.1 points average. 22.9 rebounds. 4.4 assists. Two-time champion. Four-time MVP. 13-time All-Star. 10-time All-NBA. Uh, All I mean, this guy is one of the greatest historical players all time in the NBA. And there's a reason we still talk about him to this day. Easily. Easily. Yeah. Yeah, and because I have him at number three, my number two, who actually went up against this man and during a time when really big men were the face of the NBA, I have Bill Russell, an absolute goat of his time. This guy, 15.1 points, 22.5 rebounds, 4.3 assists, 
11 time champion. He won 11 champions. That is bullshit Montreal Canadian shit. That was with one team too, right? With the Celtics? Oh, it's disgusting. Five-time yes. MVP, 12-time All-Star, 11-time All-NBA. Now, Wilt and Bill Russell, it's kind of a toss-up. I know people can put Wilt at number two and Bill at number three or, or mix it together. They played together, but I have Bill just edging him out. I don't know. And number one. <laughs> yeah, you do know. <laughs> <laughs> number one. One of the greatest players all time, and apparently one of just the best guys absolutely off the card. Kareem Abdul Jabbar at number one. I honestly am thinking he's going to be your number one, no spoiler alert, but how could you not? I mean, this guy, 24.6 points, 11.2 rebounds, 3.6 assists, 2.6 blocks. He's a six time champion, a six time MVP, 19 time All Star. Yeah, 19 time All Star, 15 time All NBA. And he's an 11-time all-defensive. He could be maybe one of the most decorated players individually in NBA history. Is he your top Laker? Yeah. Yeah, he's your number one? Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Yeah. I would have him over Kobe. Magic for me. Magic at one. Kareem. Kobe. Shaq, and I don't even I don't know who number five would be because there's Jerry, so many Jerry West. Yeah, maybe something. Jerry West. Yeah, yeah, probably okay, you know probably what? the logo. Probably the logo. Yeah, I just I just blanked on Magic. You're completely yeah. right. I will agree with that entire. Right now, this is the nothing but Miss Lakers podcast. Magic, Magic, <laughs> one, Kareem two, yeah. Kobe three, Shaq, and then Jerry West. Shaq, Jerry West, whatever you want to say. Yeah, you, you have me. Yeah. Dude, 100%. I agree with that Laker list. Boom. I love it. Okay. That's my top five big men. And I love that game. Melky, you, buddy. Bro, I think you and I share the same brain sometimes, man, because our list is the same. My order isn't the same, but all five players are on my list. Uh, I will start with my number five is Hakeem the Dream. He made my number five. You listed his stats, decorated. He was the catalyst in Houston for those back-to-back titles. Uh, also had, like, the sweetest fucking jump uh, hook I've ever seen. Like, the man could play. The man had charisma. He kind of reminded me of, like, a Muhammad Ali on the court, in a sense. And Houston would be nothing without uh, Akeem Dream Olajuwon. So he was my number five. Then he got the big diesel at number four. What can you really say about Shaq that hasn't been said? Love Four him. titles, you know, like you said, in his NBA career, probably, and like I, I was saying earlier, probably the last of a dying breed of centers. He's like the last of your traditional dominant big man. Yeah, so just in the shit. paint, you can't move. Yeah, them. they're just a force to be reckoned with. Behind exactly. Yeah, and just to think, if he, him, and Kobe actually got along or could um, squash their beef or just put aside their beef, they would have won. Probably another three titles in LA. But sometimes that's why you win those four because even though they don't mess, you just need that caliber. Absolutely. So I mean, I mean, they. I don't know if they regret it because they both had great careers. But imagine like the Lakers stayed together until like they were put to pasture. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And so number three, Bill Russell, and like you said, Russell and Chamberlain are they could go. Three, they could go two, you know what I mean? It's just, and it always what stands out is the fact he won 11 <laughs> championships. Like, yeah, 11. Holy shit. He was like a defensive genius who um, epitomized the words leader, team, and champion. Greatest winner in uh, American sports history. That was quoted by um, Chris Broussard, who's a great analyst. And he's right. The greatest winner in American sports history. That's nuts, man. Yeah. And at number two, Will Chamberlain. And I have him at number two because he fucked his way around the NBA. <laughs> I he just fucked had to his put way him... around the United States, apparently. Oh, man. Look, this, this, this man got around and well-deserved. Uh, just a freak of nature. Um, basically a real-life Superman. Like, if you want to, like, compare superheroes, this guy was the closest thing to Superman. And... 
man, just a freak of athleticism. I think he started that whole like genre of like athleticism, big man. So for that, I gotta give Will Chamberlain number two, and obviously number one, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. What more can you say? You've already dropped his stats. Probably the greatest, no, the greatest big man in NBA history. No one will ever compare to him. And yeah, he epitomizes. He's the definition of the true center. So I've got to give it up. Yeah, you know what, man? And I think I agree with you, too, that he possibly will never be overtaken as the greatest because of how the game has changed so much. Yeah, there's no positions really anymore either. It's it's a lot of small ball or even the big man handle like guards because they're taught. You may as well handle like a guard, even though you're going to grow to be like 6'10", 6'11". Uh, and there's no real positions anymore. So, yeah, like those are the, it's the dying breed of the center. So, like, no one will ever be Abdul-Jabbar. I don't care what you say. No, no, 100%. Uh, that was a blast. Great minds think alike, Melky. We're going to do that next episode. And, Melky, it is your turn to choose what position we're going to do next for the top five. Do you have it now or are we going to talk after? Spoiler alert, we're doing guards. Oh, <laughs> best mouth guards out there. Okay. <laughs> mom, mom, mom. <laughs> okay. So to end this episode, like we've ended every episode this season in a tribute to Mamba, Kobe Bryant, uh, I'm going to give you what is my final playoff memory, because this will be our kind of final playoff show. And this one goes back to our, my five big centers, because mine is the famous, the lob between him and Shaq people. I know I say this every time. Please just go watch this two-minute highlight on YouTube when we talk about these things. I'm telling you, just there, there's a two-minute clip of Shaq describing how this play goes down, and it's after Kobe's passed. It's beautiful. So Lakers are down 15 points against the Portland Trailblazers. Game 7, 2000 Western Conference Finals. Not only did they erase, the, erase that 15-point lead, Melky, but Kobe – over Scotty Pippen, mm-hmm. <laughs> Portland, who were just taught to bring it back again. <laughs> what do you I'm, say to that, Pippen? <laughs> yeah, what do you say to that? Does the shimmy shake, outmaneuvers him. Shaq's going up, puts his finger up when you see the clip. Kobe, with one of the greatest basketball IQs there ever is, obviously sees this and throws a lob pass to Shaquille O'Neal, who absolutely slams it down. The Lakers win game seven absolutely unreal and one of the top moments all time in the playoffs for kobe i wanted to end on it i still remember that game i was uh, i was live, i was a little kid i was out in scarborough and as soon as that happened like just seeing shaq and kobe's reaction i knew they were gonna win the title like going into the the west the, the nba championship just that i think that was the turning point where those two clicked and said if we dominate like we can nobody's touching us that was just the thing of beauty and you knew you knew they got over the hill once he uh once he got that alley-oop and they won that series buddy you couldn't be more right because that is the start of the lakers three p yeah it, it, i honestly I'm, i i could see it in my head right now just shaq's reaction it yeah. was yeah it was the it's just the thing of beauty that that's a great that's a great that, that'll always Anytime you think of like Kobe legacy, that's always like the start for me where Kobe was going to be the one of the greatest players in NBA history. He was a shooter, man. He was a shooter. And he gave it to Shaq. And he gave it to Shaq. He deferred. That's what great players do sometimes. That's awesome. So I went on a different route. I went to the 2009 NBA Finals in Game 5. Where, uh, Kobe uh, won his fifth and final championship and defeated the Orlando Magic 99-86 to and posted 30 points, 5 assists, 6 rebounds, put the team on his back, cemented his legacy, even though it was already cemented. It just, the cement had to be, it was still drying at that point, but he just, Kobe was just Mamba mentality at its best. He had Pau, he had Lamar, you know, Orlando, they had no chance. They probably shouldn't have been there, but yeah, that, that was that always stuck out to me as like Kobe defying himself as a top five great player of all time. Yeah. That was when that veteran Kobe took over. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful buddy. Beautiful. So two great moments. And with that, our black Mamba tribute, 
uh, we're going to end this episode. This has been episode nine. Melky, this has been an absolute blast. Anything you want to say? Shout outs for the other pods or. Uh, you know what? I just want to thank the viewers and listeners, you know, for putting up with all the stinkers that we throw on, on the court. Uh, <laughs> honestly man i'm loving the small market nba championship you got milwaukee yeah. phoenix it's a thing of beauty i think it's something the nba needs um i hope you know i just hope uh, it turns out to be actually it already is a great series i just hope i kind of hope it goes the distance um you know i just want to thank you you know for being my partner in crime uh it's always a blast man this is like easy where you and i could just talk ball for like hours on end um and yeah, we'll be texting after this too so. yeah oh yeah and it, honestly like this weekend was a great great for sports in general you had italy and england final oh the group uh, chat was flying <laughs> it was <laughs> flooded man i had a softball <laughs> game and i come back and like oh man look at i missed uh, <laughs> um yeah it was great that italy, that was a great game uh, you had connor connor mcgregor breaking his ankle which was the thing of beauty um still running his mouth too after he broke his ankle so yeah that's like, that that's bullshit Maybe he staged it. I think he is. I think he. I think he deliberately broke his ankle so he wouldn't get his face fucked like piled in by Poirier because he was getting a mashed in. He had no chance. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Um, but yeah, Italy won. It's raining Chef Boardi everywhere. And, and, and uh, Italy. sorry, sorry, but I know your uh, England roots, but those are the breaks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? It's all right. I've I've had so much heartbreak this year. Sports. I'm I'm already just like rocked over the heart. Like doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't affect me. Yeah, but no, buddy. This has been an absolute blast. I'll thank you as well. Um, I am so excited that those two teams behind you are in the championship, and we're not seeing the fucking Nets versus the Lakers, which I pushed out at the beginning and said that would happen. I'm so glad I was wrong because I cannot stand that super team shit. Yeah, everybody was wrong. I was wrong. I fucking said the Nets in six. Um, but, you know, would the NBA a change for a reason? And speaking of changes, need changes in your life? I know I do. What better way than to up your manscaping game? Visit smoothmyballs.com. Use promo NA30 for additional discount. It's time to get serious down low. All the unnecessary hair must go. <laughs> yeah lads everything's opening up again it, it's time to meet people and talk in real life so get on that let's start smelling good and looking good too absolutely and what better way to do it than visiting smoothmyballs.com you said it so besides that i'm going to be doing a jay's all-star uh break podcast with anthony l jefe we're going to be talking where the jays are at i'm excited to do that Melky and I, we're going to be joined by our typical co-host, Gooby and John, shortly. We're going to have a new Mustard episode coming up. But more importantly, to end this episode, ladies and gentlemen, next episode, episode 10, the season finale of season one of Nothing But Miss. This has been an absolute blast. I can't wait to talk about end of the season, who won this championship, right or wrong, how many we got it. <laughs> it's going to be an absolute firecracker, buddy. Well, you know we're going to be wrong, but yeah, I can't wait. It's sad that we have to end it, but at the same time, I, I'm stoked just to get it all out there and discuss the finals, the ups and downs, this whole roller coaster ride of the NBA season. It's going to be one prolific ride, and don't miss out because if you do, it sucks to be you. Buddy, just wait. Season two, episode one, we're going to have fresh Raptors talk, not just play out. It's going to be a whole new basketball season soon. That and fresh jerseys. Oh, I can't wait. I'll be rocking one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, like I said, you'll check us on the season finale. This is nothing but miss. That's Melky. I'm Ba, and we'll see you next time. Peace. Peace. One last shout out to the boys from Sports for You podcast crew, Jonathan, Mark, Nick, and producer Ben. They're doing big things. Check them out once a week. Do it now. Yeah, seriously, guys, please check them out. Unreal. Eagles look. Oh, fuck you, Cowboy Slug. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha!